I'd like to talk about how reality sort of pans out in the afterlife states and how I experienced it during my out-of-body experiences. So the first thing I would like to say, uh, reality on the other side is very much like it is here. Um, the first time I noticed that there was no such thing as um, as death happened spontaneously in in 1960 1970 when i got up very early in the morning and i suddenly had a sort of a flash of inspiration where i realized there's no such thing as death i didn't know where it came from but I was I was walking into the morning into sunlight and suddenly realized there's no such thing as death. That was way before I had uh, my out of body experiences. But this this thought really struck me, and I thought there's no there's no end to life. It is a continuous thing, and I couldn't get it out of my system. So since then, I had plenty of opportunity to verify of course, that there is no such thing as as a break in life. And I experienced that during my out-of-body experiences. It, it's, it's in, in some experiences, it was almost like walking from one room into the next. There was not even a break of consciousness. And there was also the same vivid experience of reality as I had before. There was no difference. So I then spent the next 40 years sort of getting deeper and deeper into the phenomena of life after death. And of course, as you know, I wrote, uh, I wrote uh, two books about it. And, and I think I just like to sort of point this out because in, in this book here, there's uh, uh, probably quite a few hours of reading material which cannot be summarized in, in, a, in a short video. But I want to try to explain how I see reality. First of all, I had various experiences when I had out-of-body experiences. One was, for example, which I also wrote in Vistas of Infinity, which was very curious, because there's always the possibility that it's not an out-of-body experience, but a lucid dream. A lucid dream is basically a dream in which we are fully awake, but nevertheless, it feels totally real, but the content of the lucid dream is taken from our subconscious. And that is a difficult thing. So in order to discriminate between the two states, what I used to do, I uh, used my awareness and to become aware of a here-now state, just like we do here, by... Um, by focusing on an object until I only saw the object that could have been my hands or something on the ground. And by by this type of focus, any dream content would sort of evaporate. That could mean if there were people which came from my dream experience and they were projected into the reality, they just evaporated until I was in a here and now state Although the state was not a physical state, it was an, a copy of the physical state or another dimensional state. And that is not easy to understand because this is where, where my definition of reality came from, is, is total awareness of that which is, okay, without any elaboration, without any projections. So I then... Whenever I had an out-of-body experience, the first thing I did from then on, I focused on either on the ground or on my hands until I had full waking awareness and until I was absolutely sure that the reality um, I saw was a consensus here and now reality. And, and on this basis, I recorded everything I saw and on this basis, I was, I became, I was sure that what uh, the ex what I had was uh, objective experience. Now, there's another thing, of course. Um, 
the experiences can be anything. And one experience I, I written about in, um, in Vistas of Infinity which was very strange. I woke up in a town which was basically a, a drawing. It was like walking through a, a, a town which was made out of cartoon characters and drawings. And I was very confused and I thought, oh, that is not right. This is a dream. This must be a dream because it is not real. And so I focused, but instead of the town disappearing, it became more and more real. So I thought there's something wrong here until I realized as I walked, as I looked further down the road, there were two people with what seemed to be the, having an iPad and they were as I approached them, I found out that they were the creators of this cartoon town into which I stumbled by accident. And so I interviewed these guys and asked them what they were doing. And they told me, yes, what we are doing is our hobby. You know, we are creating a life, real life animations. And that was very confusing. But also this opened up the whole the whole area of the afterlife territories, which is uh, very much guided by our imagination. Uh, it is like a virtual reality in, in which we can unleash powers which are totally out of this, literally out of this world, which we just cannot do here. We can now, we have now started doing it via virtual reality, you know, so that is just a technology which has come up. But on the astral level, everything is quite uh, is dramatically different, is, is much more um, powerful, much more real. You know, I investigated all kinds of things. I started investigating phenomena, for example, how, how the mind superimposes uh, things onto the world. And then I discovered that some people who get into areas of the afterlife which feel very very real but they're only projections of their minds and I found it I sometimes I sometimes um, entered these these projections but and this is where it is really rather complicated and I think I will properly dedicate another book into into the exploration of this phenomena because there are two things at work there's I, there's on one hand there's our subconscious uh, identity our, our subconscious experience which projects into the external world but at the same time it also draws us into a congruent uh, energetic um, consensus field which is in harmony with how we feel and what we experience. So we can actually, when we have got a negative experience, we will be automatically drawn into an environment which is congruent with our inner experience. On the other hand, we can also enter a subjective experience which only happens in our immediate field, viewing field. And, and we can very quickly get out of this experience. So basically is what we experience here when we have negative thoughts or we have very beautiful thoughts. They are only happening in our individual field of reality, but they're not visible to other people. And this makes it all really, really complicated because on the astral level, whatever we experience inside is is for us subjectively is also a reality and the only way we can get out of this conundrum is by um, becoming aware and that is the biggest thing and that's the most important thing I found in order to get awareness we have to focus on on the pure state of being and then then we can enter an incredibly wide variety of experiences open to us. We can travel to any part in this infinite, beautiful astral world um, without being impeded by our, our fantasies and so on. So most people who, who pass over, 
what they do is they bring their um, their beliefs or their identification with them and out of this identification the identification they bring with them they create their environment they are attracted in into the environment so if, let's say you've got uh, you're living here and you've got a house with a garden and you're really sort of settled into that you have got friends and so on now this identification you bring over energetically into the afterlife state and nothing much will have changed. You will still be uh, the same person and uh, very naturally you will uh, be drawn or you will recreate the environment you have used, you are used to. And so that is the most natural thing for people to happen because they are identified with a certain... Um, lifestyle, a certain persona, a certain environment, and they will carry this this over and nothing has changed. But when we, for example, have um, emotions, then we can, they can express themselves in two ways. They can express themselves in the environment, uh, in, in all kinds of different ways because the environment is very receptive to us, very receptive to our feelings. And the way I experienced it when I was visiting people, let's say, on a higher dimensional level, and they had beautiful, they were beautiful people and they had a beautiful conversation, uh, the environment was becoming more beautiful. There, for example, uh, suddenly, uh, let's say we were standing under a tree and somebody expressed some beautiful thought, suddenly the tree would, the blossoms would sprout, you know, so the environment is quite receptive to how we feel, you know. Of course, the same happens on the, on the negative levels, you know. So this, this whole uh, new environment takes a while to get used to for people. But very soon people take it for granted. They take for granted, for example, that if they want to have a cup of tea, they take for granted that they don't go out and, and put the kettle on. They just have a cup of tea. And in my first book, I analyzed these energies which were taking place in multidimensional man. There are certain, um, certain energies, and one energy is the energy the creative energy of expectation. Something we are used to, something we are identified with, is readily available to us. So if I want to if I want to have a cup of tea and I'm expecting a cup of tea to the inhabitants who live there, this is the most natural thing in the world to suddenly have a cup of tea if they wanted to. It is far more difficult, which I've tried with people when I ask them how how do you create things? You know, and they said, "Yeah, you just uh, take it for granted. You just expect it." And and then I tried to, for example, um, make a cup of tea. And what I ended up with was some sort of obscure, leaking cup, uh, and the tea was nothing but water. You know, so when when the intent came in, and uh, something I wanted to do, which wasn't quite naturally. It didn't work out as well as if I suddenly uh, expected something. So, so as we can see, the reality shifts completely on, on the other dimensional level, but that is something people who, are, uh, who get used to it, who live there, they take it all in their stride. It's, it's become something like second nature. You know, and people, of course, play with these phenomena and they do all sorts of things.